Let's talk about the large intestine. So the ileum of the small intestine leads to the large intestine. They are connected by a valve. On the picture right here, the valve is labeled. It's the ileocecal valve. It's connecting the ileum of the small intestine and the cecum of the large intestine. The cecum is just this pouch down here. And once the chyme passes in through that valve, what's going to happen is it will travel upwards. It goes up through the ascending colon, and then it will cut across through the transverse colon, and then it will come down through the descending colon, go around here, this is called the sigmoid colon. It's called sigmoid because it's kind of a sigmoid shape. It's kind of an S shape. Uh, so it's this curvy region of the large intestine. Sigmoid colon leads to the rectum, and then the anus would be the opening where the, the feces would leave the body. So all of this put together is what we refer to as the large intestine, or also known as the colon. The colon is referring to the same thing. And again, the, the word large in the name, the large intestine, large is referring to the diameter. The diameter of this tube is pretty large relative to the small intestine. Um, you notice on the outside of the large intestine, it's got all these sort of bumps and almost like nodules. Those are called haustra. Um, haustrum is a single, single one of those. And these are structures that are pretty characteristic of the large intestine. If the wall of the large intestine weakens over time for some reason, uh, those haustra may start to bulge and then that's called a diverticula. Diverticula can be problematic. They can be sites where um, perhaps f food gets kind of stuck and that can, can lead to inflammation, that can lead to problems. That's called having diverticulitis. Uh, this is something that eating a high fiber diet really helps, helps with. It helps to prevent the development of diverticulitis. If diverticulitis is going to develop, it'll probably be in the sigmoid colon, in this region where there are some turns. Um, that tends to be where diverticula form, if they're going to form. Again, this is not something that everybody necessarily has. We don't all necessarily have these, um, these bulges, but people who do, generally they're people who have low fiber diets, and so that's not a good thing. We wanna have fiber in our diets. We're gonna see more of that coming up in just a minute. What are the major roles of the large intestine? There's actually not very much digestion that takes place here. There's primarily absorption and also just storage of feces. So let's go on and take a look at the function. Um, water absorption, we said that happens in the small intestine. It continues in the large intestine. And I want you to think about that for just a minute. It makes sense to save water storage till pretty late in the GI tract, right? Because what would happen? What would happen if water absorption happened I don't know, at the beginning of the small intestine and the duodenum, uh, if you absorb the water that early on, then the, the food, the chyme, is going to be a lot harder. It's gonna be more difficult to, to keep it moving through the tract. So by waiting to absorb the water until here later on, uh, this really helps just with overall, right, keeping things moving along. So water absorption happens pretty late in the GI tract. We also absorb, um, continue to absorb electrolytes, and some of the vitamins in the large intestine. We also produce vitamins. Let me clarify that. We don't produce vitamins. The microbes that live in us produce vitamins in the large intestine. Um, the microbial population that lives here in the large intestine is very important. We're gonna be pretty focused on this for the rest of this video. Before we get there though, last major function for the large intestine is to store the feces, right? temporary storage until they're uh, eliminated from the body. So let's come back to number three. We have microbial organisms that live in the large intestine. There are a lot of them that live here and they're extremely important. There are many different species of bacteria that live here in the large intestine. We refer to them as the microflora or the microbiota. It's this whole population of um, many different species of bacteria. And most of them are anaerobic, meaning they don't need oxygen. Makes sense, right? There's not a lot of oxygen that makes it down here to the large intestine. So they're anaerobic, but they're doing things that, that are very important for us. They're actually producing substances that we then absorb once they produce them. So some of them are mutualistic, both the bacteria and us benefit from the interaction. Others seem to just be kind of commensal. They benefit, um, doesn't really seem to have a major effect on us one way or the other, their presence being there. Um, but in any case, they're, they're 
overall, having this population seems to be very important to our health, and we're going to get into some reasons why. The initial colonization, so where do these bacteria come from? Initial colonization happens at childbirth. So prior to childbirth, um, a baby that has not been born yet, a baby has not been exposed to bacteria yet at that point. So it's pretty sterile conditions inside prior to being born. But when a baby is born, and that's the first exposure to bacteria that live in the vagina, if it's a vaginal childbirth. Um, they, if it's a cesarean childbirth, still, same thing. The mother is the first thing that exposes the child to bacteria. It would just be bacteria in, in the skin as the baby is brought out of the mother during a cesarean section. So either way, uh, first colonization is based on the mother's microbial population. Um, an interesting thing that is of current interest right now with regards to the microbial populations of the intestine, there seems to be a strong correlation between or obesity and um, the diversity of microorganisms that live here. Obese individuals tend to not have as much diversity in their microbial populations um, versus lean individuals tend to have a lot of diversity. So this kind of, this suggests that the microbial population is very tied to to our health. All right. Um, oh yeah, one other note. I'm just look, looking at my notes here to make sure I didn't leave anything out. Um, one sort of interesting study that's been done about, about with regards to this, with regards to obesity, is in mice. There have been mice that were raised germ-free, meaning that their intestines do not have microbes living in them yet. And then what they did is they took uh, some mice that were obese, Okay, um, raised just kind of normally, not germ-free. They took some of the microbiota from um, the obese mice and they transplanted it into, into the germ-free mice. And what happened is the germ-free mice did start gaining weight. So that's kind of a significant observation, just a note sort of of interest. Okay, so let's take a look uh, a little bit more here at these microbes. What are some things that they are doing for us? What do we know about them? Some of the primary benefits that we obtain from these microbes is that they make vitamins, vitamins that we can then absorb. Um, so these microbes, they're able to digest things that we cannot. They have enzymes that we do not have in our brush borders. And one of the things that they can do is use some of the cellulose. So we cannot digest cellulose, right? Cellulose just passes through, small intestine doesn't really get affected. Um, it helps to add bulk to the feces and it's a, it's a very healthy thing to have, even though we don't, um, we don't digest it. So once the microbes get a hold of it, they are able to use some of it. And some of the byproducts of cellulose digestion are really critical to us. So one of the things, one of the key things that the microbes make um, as a result of processing cellulose is fatty acid chains. Fatty acids can be taken up. We can absorb fatty acids and they're very useful. Fatty acids can be used to provide energy directly, energy for those epithelial cells lining the intestine. So it helps to promote the health of the intestinal lining. It also helps to, um, to promote secretion, um, secretion of the epithelial cells, the things that they're supposed to secrete sort of upregulates that secretion. That in turn helps to keep things moving along through the intestine, keep things from getting stuck. Um, so this is helping to, in some ways, this is helping to prevent diverticulitis from developing. Some of the short chain fatty acids act as messenger molecules. They can actually go and act on the brain. This can influence insulin secretion uh, so that's kind of an interesting and complex relationship there. And then finally, some of the fatty acids that are produced help us to absorb electrolytes and in turn water. So all of these things, um, these are just a consequence of microbes doing their own thing, digesting cellulose. We actually get a number of benefits from them doing this. And then finally, last on the list, Beneficial bacteria, just the fact that they are there means that harmful bacteria can't be there. So they're kind of just taking up space. And they're, they're being good neighbors, so to speak. If you have good neighbors, then by definition, it's not possible for you to have a bad neighbor, right? Because that, that, that space is already filled. Things that influence the intestinal microbiome. Well, diet does for sure have a role. And this is one thing that 
so it's kind of it's this kind of a nice thing to focus on this is something that we do have control over right it's something Sometimes I think it feels like a lot of physiology is just a lot of information to learn and it's fascinating, it's complex, but maybe it seems like we don't have a lot of control over it. Well, here's something that we do certainly have control over, our diets. Diets that promote health of the microbiome are diets that are high in fiber, low in fat, low in sugar. So kind of on the downer side of this, this is kind of the anti-American diet. American diets tend to be low in fiber, high in fat, high in sugar. So just the opposite of what, what they should be in terms of promoting health of the microbiome. Uh, but this is something that we can all make intentional changes towards. And I would say uh, if, if you're in a spot where you've had not a good diet, if you're trying to make changes, uh, one thing to, to keep in mind, so I think sometimes diets fail when people try and make changes to their diet sometimes it fails because they try and do too much at once if you try and make all these drastic changes all at once it becomes overwhelming maybe it works for a few days but then you end up reverting back to your to your old habits i think probably a more effective approach is is to make make gradual changes changes that you can stick with that you can make yourself hold to so if you've had I don't know, if you've had a high sugar, high fat, low fiber diet, maybe the first thing to do is just intentionally start incorporating more fiber. Don't worry about the fat and sugar in the short term, just, just focus on one thing at a time. Get more fiber in your diet. How do you do that? Fruits and veggies for sure are a good way, including fruits and veggies. Um, but on top of that, just making conscious choices about like what bread do you choose to, to eat? Do you buy white bread or could you maybe substitute that with, with whole wheat bread? Um, whole grain materials are a lot higher in fiber than not whole grain materials. So anyway, some, some things to think about. Um, if it's easier for you to tackle sugar, go for sugar first. One of the things that I try to do with regards to sugar is um, just decreasing how much. So like if I have a recipe, if I want to make cookies, I make cookies, but I just cut back on how much sugar I put in. A lot of times half the sugar, it still tastes good. Um, so some things you can you can try there. Okay, this intestinal microbiome, in the end, it actually ties in with inflammation, which we learned about in the immune system. Inflammation is something that can be triggered by damage. Um, and just by having a healthy microbiome, the fact that that helps to promote epithelial cell health and keep that barrier strong, that means that it's going to limit how much inflammation is going on in the intestinal tract. So this is a good thing. This also helps to promote regulatory T lymphocyte activity as opposed to cytotoxic T cell activity. So that's another, another good thing, right? We don't want killer T cells to be active unnecessarily. Um, so having a, a good microbiome is going to help facilitate that as well. If the intestinal microbiome gets out of balance, what can happen? Well, one of the things that can happen is diarrhea. And if this imbalance is a long-term thing, then that can end up leading to inflammatory bowel disease. And that's a, that's a problem. We'll come back to that in just a minute. Before we get there, let's just think about inflammation, wrap up inflammation. Why don't the normal bacteria promote inflammation? So one thing, again, just they're promoting secretion, the epithelial cells to secrete, so it helps to keep that mucus layer healthy. That in turn keeps a separation between the bacterial cells and our cells. So even though the bacteria are present, there's a little bit of a gap between them and us. Um, technically, remember, this is all on the outside of the body. So if the microbes are, are living on that mucus layer, not under the mucus layer, then there's not going to be a, a triggering of inflammation in that case. 